Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Crane Seminar on Solution to Pollution. Um, thank you for coming. Hopefully you had no problems finding Sunset Country Club, uh, and it wasn't really inconvenient for you in any, in any way. So my name is Don Hennon, and I work in the claim department at Crane. Uh, I work with Molly Sumner, who could not be here today. She's on assignment in Boston. So uh, we are going to serve food uh, throughout the presentation, so that's going to be a little bit of distra distraction, so hopefully you can bear with us there. Um, we have some new people here today, so I kind of want to talk about uh, our seminars and how they work. Uh, we have two seminars a year put on by the claim department, one in the spring and one in the fall, and we've had a wide variety of topics over the years. Uh, we've gone over uh, workers' compensation and the new laws. We've had uh, seminars on management liability, uh, risk transfer, and things like that. So we have a wide range of topics. And the idea really is to give you information so you can take it back to your shops and analyze uh, your insurance needs. And just kind of gives you time to sort of think about things and then just open a, a dialogue with your brokers. So um, we think it's important for you to get the information. Uh, and I think we're the only agency in St. Louis that does these seminars. So. Um, it's free, so the price is right. Um, so uh, hopefully you'll c continue to come uh, to the seminars and enjoy them. Um, our topic today is pollution, and uh, we're going to go over basically how pollution coverage has kind of evolved over the years. If uh, you have auto, GL, and property, and you think you have pollution coverage, you might have some coverage, but really the insurance companies have limited that coverage over the years. So they've restricted their coverage, and they really want you to buy a pollution policy. So we have a couple of speakers today here from Ironshore, and we're going to introduce them later. But the reason we came up with this topic is we had a claim uh, come in through our office uh, a few months ago. We had a large HVAC commercial manufacturer that a bank asked them to uh, build them a unit. Uh, the bank had the unit delivered to their bank out in New York and it was installed by somebody else. Well, the day before the bank was supposed to uh, open, um, they had a claim. So basically, glycol leaked from this HVAC system causing $600,000 in damage to this brand new bank. So the bank only had GL coverage, did not have pollution coverage, so they were freaking out a little bit on this claim because they knew they didn't have uh, uh, pollution coverage, but they also didn't have anything to do with the glycol. So we reported the claim to their carrier under GL as a product liability kind of claim, and they actually defended the bank under reservation of rights, which we were, we were glad they did. Um, so the bank, uh, the, the insurance carrier actually did an investigation and determined that the loss really was uh, as a result of the installer's poor installation. So the bank was actually able to tender, uh, actually the HVAC, HVAC uh, company was able to tender the loss to uh, the installer. Uh, so the, really the, the, the HVAC company got out of the claim. Uh, but what, what it really did was the owner of the business realized they had sp exposure for pollution in other areas of their business. So they actually bought a policy with Crane for the pollution coverage for the other areas of their business. Uh, so that's what brought this whole topic up. Um, so we think it's important for you to really sit back and analyze your, your position and your coverages to make sure you have coverage for this. Today, we have two speakers from Ironshore. We have Maureen Lanty. Uh, she's a VP production specialist from Ironshore. She works out of the Chicago office. And we also have Mike Delmar. He is the VP of uh, uh, ECU managers in the St. Louis office. And I'd like you to, to welcome them here today for their speech. So please welcome them. Good morning, everyone. They're um, videotaping this, so they said we have to speak to the microphone. So I talk with my I talk with my hands a lot, and I roam. So if you see me do this and then come back, that's why I <laughs> smile for the camera. Um, all right. So you want to flip that slide for me? And here I go already roaming. All right. So uh, today we're just gonna. This is what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna do an uh, really an introduction to pollution, uh, pollution regulation, and pollution insurance. So we're going to talk about the history of environmental insurance, and really to understand the history of environmental insurance, you really have to look at um, the environmental regulation and how that's evolved over the years. So we'll talk about that a little bit. We're going to talk about the, the current environmental insurance marketplace, 
uh, typical coverages that you can find available, not just with Ironshore, but throughout the, uh, the market. Talk about uh, limits and terms, and then uh, some claims examples. So as we go through, um, it's always best if we have questions, if something comes up, if something rings a bell, or something you've heard, and you want to ask about it, just you know, go ahead and, and ask about it. Um, and I think the claims examples are the big thing, because everybody looks at it and says, you know, I've never had a loss, or none of my insurers have had a loss. Uh, so we'll try to talk about a little bit of some of the, the things we've seen, some that you can look at and say, well, yeah, obviously anybody could have saw that one coming, and then the stuff maybe that you hadn't seen. Um, so before we get started, one thing that Maureen and I were talking about is, let's just get an idea of kind of who's here, so we have an idea of what to talk about. How many brokers are here? All right, then how many um, contractors? Couple. Manufacturers, all right, so we got a little bit of, little bit of everybody here. Um, one thing that you'll notice as we kind of go through this is um, we'll keep coming back to um, you know, the, the what-if scenarios, the stuff that, like I said, is a little bit odd. Like we had a, um, a did claims call yesterday. We do this quarterly with our claims department. So we'll go through some of our insurers and the losses that they've had and talk about how they're developing and you know, maybe what we need to, to do to help you know, mitigate the loss with the insured. And one claim that I thought was interesting was we wrote a policy for a contractor who was building a tank farm and a few of the ancillary pipelines to go to an airport, right? So our contractor did all this stuff, put it all together, and after it was up and running, they get a phone call from the owner. Said, it's leaking. I don't know what you did, but it's leaking, and it's all your fault. So they said, well, let's check it out. So they came back out and looked at it, and I said, well, look, the damage is from this little pipe here, and it's leaking. You know, that's not us. What they discovered was the, you know, contractor that they brought in after all the work was done just to put the fence up hit the pipeline just a little bit so it leaked wasn't enough to set off the sensors wasn't enough to say we have a big issue just enough to have a slow leak and they're probably looking right now just in the testing and the monitoring to figure out what they have probably five hundred thousand dollars so guess whose fault it is right it goes back to the fence guy so as you're talking about, thinking about what we're talking about today, and you're thinking about, well, you know what? My insurer doesn't deal with anything hazardous. They don't deal with asbestos. They don't deal with this stuff. Neither did the defense guy, and he's the one that's on the hook for this. And at the end of the day, it's gonna probably be a million dollar loss. By the time they go investigate, figure out what's wrong, do the cleanup, because they just nicked this little pipe. Anyway, um, so that's some of the stuff we're gonna talk about today. Let me go to the next slide. So I mentioned to really understand the current environmental marketplace, we need to step back you know, 40 years or 50 years and see how did environmental regulation develop and how does that relate to insurance policies and insurance coverage. So I just started off thinking, all right, so the big, I think the, the big starting point for um, environmental regulation, but also an understanding of environmental concepts really happened in uh, 1962 when Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring. And what that was, was a notification really to the nation saying something's going on, right? We used to have birds chirping and we had insects chirping and we had all this noise in the summer. Now it's nothing. It's silent. What's going on? And what she did is attributed it back to pesticides, specifically DDT use. So there, and there was all kinds of flare up, right? The stuff that you would hear nowadays, we'd say, well, it's just these, you know, the crazy tree huggers are out there saying all this random stuff and it doesn't really pertain to us. Um, somebody even said that, um, that uh, she, was, she was trying to starve Americans because what she's really doing is telling farmers not to use pesticides, and that was ultimately her goal, because obviously she was a communist. Um, but what she was really doing is just bringing notice to, hey guys, there's something that we're doing here that's not right. And then you had, during that time, really from the 60s to the early 70s, you had a lot of different environmental losses. We go into them, you guys could look them all up, but another one that was interesting is the Cuyahoga River in Ohio burst into flames. Uh, one day, they, uh, the river itself caught fire, they had flames five stories uh, high, 
and they attributed it to uh, just releases and um, spills and leaks from different oil and chemicals uh, facilities all up along, along the river. So they kept discharging into the river and eventually it caught fire. So again, like I said, the river was burning. Um, you also had mining disasters, nuclear issues. So you had a, a lot of um, environmental issues coming up to the forefront at one time, which then put pressure on the regulators, on the government, to say, we've got to do something about this. So then in 1970, President Nixon said, okay, we're going to create the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. They're going to monitor all this stuff. But really, we had, we had a, handful, a handful of regulations that were out there for environmental management, but nothing like this that started, like I said, with the EPA. So a couple of the, uh, the key regulation that came out was first was, was RICRA, and what that was geared to do is uh, regulate hazardous waste and garbage. Uh, really, we call that cradle to grave. So what we wanted to do was manifest what chemicals, what wastes were being used by whom and where. So that way it could be tracked. So if there was a spill or there was a release or there was an issue at a site, we could go back and say, oh, okay, we know what it is and we know who's, who's responsible for it. So RICRA was the first uh, real regulation. Um, and then you had, after that, that was in about 1975, 76. After that, uh, we had a couple of issues with um, particular sites, um, Love Canal, and then locally Times Beach. So, and this was uh, late 70s, early 80s. Um, long story short with Love Canal, you guys probably heard of it, but what happened was, Years prior to this, there was going to be a uh, residential development in Niagara Falls. They had a little canal there, and they were going to build homes, but then there was some um, financial issues. They ended up not doing it. Eventually, they sold to a, uh, the canal part to a chemical company because they wanted to dispose of their spent um, chemicals, their spent solvents and whatnot. So they ended up dumping like 22,000 drums of chemicals in this canal. They covered it all up. Then you fast forward a long time um, to the 80s where Niagara Falls said, we need a new school. But what are we going to do? Well, we've got this big vacant piece of property here. Let's build the school there. This is a great idea. So they started digging and they said, wait a minute, we found a drum. 22,000 drums later, they said, we've got a real big mess. What are we going to do for it? The company at the time, Hooker Chemical, was long out of business. So like, well, great. There's no funds available. There's no way to pay for this cleanup. You know, what are we going to do? And about the same time, locally, we had Times Beach. Um, you guys probably know the story, but long, short, long story short, small community here um, just southwest of us, and there was a contractor that was hired to um, spray oil on the dirt roads for dust suppression. So he went out and he would sprayed the oil down, keeps the dust down. So he, he was doing this and then all of a sudden he made contact with some other companies and said, hey, we've got all this used oil too, you should do that. So he was like, great. Um, he took all this other used oil back to his facility, mixed it with some other stuff, then went out and sprayed. Well, really, it was dioxin, PCBs, contaminated. So the whole, all the streets in the whole town was, uh, was contaminated. And obviously, not you know what happened. The EPA had to come in and you know, basically buy out the town, dig all the soils up, uh, burn it, and clean it all up. And now it's a, now it's a park. But what these, what these two issues really did is give, drive, the, drive the EPA to say, OK, we need some more regulation to, to determine what are we going to do with these sites, and how are we going to pay for them? So that's where CERCLA comes in. You guys probably know it by Superfund. That's really, the concept behind it was really polluter pays. So what they wanted to know is who caused the contamination, and let's make them responsible for, uh, for cleaning it up. Now, they call it Superfund because what they did is they gathered up, okay, we have all this money now, and we're going to go clean up sites with it. Well, really, it wasn't that much money, and the sites were so contaminated that they had to go out and find PRPs, potential responsible parties, to help pay for some of this cleanup. Um, so what Circular did a couple of things. So not only were they trying to find the polluters to make them pay, 
but they said, who are our contributors to this? So if there's a site that happens to be super fun, and really now this concept has trickled down through all of the environmental regulation, may, federal or the state level, where they say, okay, contamination and you know, the, who was the polluter could be attributed to the owner of the site, could be attributed to the operator of a site, could be attributed to the um, transporter of the product or waste that caused the contamination, and also could be attributed to the arranger, right, the, the broker of who said, oh, you have this amount of, of waste, this landfill will take it, I'll coordinate that for you. They could all be held responsible for this. The other interesting thing with CERCLA is it has joint several liability. So if you had a site that was contaminated, and let's say it was $50 million to clean it up, like I said, they could go after the owner, the operator, the arranger, the transporter, and they say, hey guys, this site's contaminated, everybody else is out of business, but you're still viable, you're still in business, we can make you responsible for any or all of this cleanup. You gotta keep in mind, environmental regulations wasn't set up to be fair. It was set up to protect human health and the environment and clean up these sites. That's ultimately the goal. Um, there was, there's a history with CERCLA and how it's evolved over the years, but there was one famous case out east where there was a, a landfill that was contaminated and they had no one that they could say, here's our main PRP. So we're gonna go down this huge list of everybody, including a restaurant owner who they said, you would have thrown away on average 15 big pens a year that contained X amount of this chemical, which means you're responsible for $50,000 of this cleanup. <laughs> and she was like, what? So, the, so environmental regulation has evolved from that to say, okay, now, now there's, there's PRPs, and there, then you could be a PRP, but it's something called de minimis, which means, yeah, you know what, you probably have something to do with this, but we're gonna go after these other big guys first. But it doesn't say we're not gonna come after you at some point. It also doesn't say that um, the contamination might be in the soil and it might be lead. But now you're working on the site, doing, you're an electrician hanging lights. It doesn't say that because you're new to the site after the contamination was present that you still can't be liable for this. It's very open. So you got the joint and several liability. The other thing it does is, um, we always talk about with insur insurance, especially statute of limitations, right? What's the statute of limitations on this or that? Well, with environmental, spe specifically contaminated sites, there isn't one. So if you owned a site for a period of a couple of years, but maybe it was contaminated before you, and you didn't know, and heck, it could be something as simple as a strip mall, right? I just owned this property, and I sold it after a few years or whatever. We had a situation where our strip mall owner leased a space to a dry cleaning drop-off facility. That's all they did was collect the clothes, right, and take it to their other facility to clean it up. Well, that's what they said they did. They actually had a small, portable little dry cleaning a uh, piece of equipment that they would use sometimes to do stuff quick if someone needs something in an hour or whatever. Well, instead of collecting the spent solvents that they used in it, they just dumped it down the drain. So um, no one knew about this at all except the gas station down the road was cleaning up their site because they had a couple of underground storage tanks that had leaked lusts. So they're pulling out the tanks and they said, well, why are we getting these hits of these chlorinated solvents, vinyl chloride and whatnot? And uh, they said, well, it's not from us, it's gotta be, so they traced it back to the strip mall and back to this dry cleaning spot. So here the owner is sitting, the reason we got involved was there was a property transaction where they were selling their facility, so they had to do some environmental reports and whatnot, and all this came up out, out of it, or I should say after the fact, where, uh, Here's our owner sitting there saying, I didn't do this, wasn't me, but he's stuck now having to pay for not only his site, right, because he had to do clean up there, but everything down gradient as well. <clears throat> so Superfund, CERCLA, allows the regulators to go back 
and say, okay, Mr. Owner, you didn't do it, we know that, but you need to pay for your site and this gas station site. <clears throat> um, like I said, the statute of limitations means we can go back. This happened you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. We can still make you re uh, responsible for the cleanup now. And the only other crime that has um, a limitless statute of limitations is murder. So you've got murder and environmental regulation, side by side. <laughs> Um, all right, so then, so what, all right, so what does all this mean? <clears throat> well, what this means for us is how does your insurance now apply? And if you go back, you know, 40 years or 45 years ago when they created the EPA, we didn't know all this stuff, right? We didn't know about... A love canal and what happens if you spray contaminated oils on roads and what happens if you just discharge into a river and it catches on fire we didn't know about the contaminants its effect we didn't know about DDT so the GL policies at the time were written right very broad they covered everything but the underwriters didn't anticipate nor underwrite for these changes in regulation, these contaminants, and the effects of those contaminants. So they said, all right, so here's what we're going to do. We neither underwrote for it or price for it, and quite frankly, we don't want to cover it. <clears throat> so we're going to add an absolute pollution exclusion. So we're not picking up any of it, and they're so proud of themselves, they said, we're so smart. <laughs> well, then the courts got a hold of it and said, yeah, but you know, absolute really doesn't mean absolute. It means you know, kind of coverage here and some kind of coverage there. So I said, well, that's not really, really what we wanted to do. So they said, well, we have total pollution exclusion. So now we're not covering everything, anything at all. Well, and as you know, that's been tested here and there, and then that's evolved into different endorsements and some coverages here and a little bit of coverages there. But again, most casualty carriers, just not something that they wanted to pick up, not something they intended to cover. So now, here we are into the 80s, and that's where Maureen and I come in, right? They say, okay, we need to come up with some environmental policies. Maybe it was a little bit before us, but all right, maybe. So, so uh, insurance companies said, wait a minute, there's a gap here, isn't there? We know what carriers want to cover, what the GL is going to pick up, and there's this gap for insurance, for environmental insurance, and we can fill that. So they created a couple different policies, and at the time, they were really specific to facilities that had these exposures that would fall under either RICRA or CERCLA. They said, okay, because we have these contaminants or potential contaminants here, we have this storage, we're going to write policies for these risks. And they were really, really expensive and very narrow in coverage. That was the good old days, wasn't it? <laughs> um, so um, think coverage has evolved from that. At the time, like I said, it was very specific to those insureds. And then we started saying, well, wait a minute. The environmental risk isn't just for these landfill facilities or these transfer facilities. It's for manufacturers. And then manufacturers evolved into, well, I'm a contractor and I work with petroleum tanks, and I work with this. So the coverage has kind of evolved and expanded. You want to hit the next slide for me? <coughs> so <coughs> it expanded. Now, one thing, um, when I say it expanded, we have several different policies and coverages that evolved from just that need. Uh, the current definition for pollutants that, that we have in our forms, and it's really based off of ISO wording, what the pollutant means any solid, liquid, gaseous, or thermal irritant or contaminant, including smoke, soot, vapors, fumes, acids, alkalized chemicals, hazardous substances, hazardous materials, or waste materials, including medical, infectious, and pathological wastes. Pollutes, pollutants also includes electromagnetic fields, mold matter, and legionella. So if I, if I would have stopped at any solid, liquid, gas, or thermal irritant or contaminant is probably broad enough. But questions evolve later. Well, what about this and what about that? So, um, so the definition kind of evolved with it. <clears throat> but the way I like to have people think about it is you don't really need to know all the environmental information that we're 
that we're going through today and how insurance applies and what the language is like and what exposures does your, does your client have, really think about it from the other side of it. I know GL, I know my property coverages, I know these other coverages, and I know what wouldn't be covered. So as you walk through their facility or walk through their job sites and you see something, you're like, I don't even know what that is, but I know it's not covered under your GL policy. That's probably where we fit in, is to come in and, and cover that. <clears throat> All right, so to get us caught up now, talking about how many uh, insurance companies are writing environmental coverage, we started off with maybe two or three AIG, um, ECS, a couple other companies back in you know, the early 80s uh, writing environmental insurance. And now we're up to basically 25, 26 retail markets. And then with the wholesalers and special programs and carriers who write very niche products, you're looking at you know, 40 some odd carriers writing some kind of environmental coverage. On the contractor's pollution side, there's at least 40 who have some kind of contractor's pollution. And then the other coverages that we'll talk about, there's, there's a, a few smaller, mar a few different markets that, that'll uh, specialize in that. So how much uh, annual pollution premium is written? Well, it's estimated that annually there's about two and a half billion dollars in insurance, uh, environmental insurance premium written each year. But the thing I thought was interesting, as we were kind of doing some research to talk today, the number I stumbled on was estimated insurable environmental exposures are estimated at 21 and a half billion. So we have an estimated 21 and a half billion dollars of environmental risk out there, and only two and a half billion of it is currently covered under insurance policy. So you look at it and say, wow, you know, what makes up, what makes up that big difference? And I would argue that it's the same thing that we've been dealing with in environmental insurance well, for the 20 years I've been in it, and that is the uneducated buyer, right? And maybe that's an uneducated purchaser, you know, the client, or an uneducated broker, and not un uneducated really in the concept of what the gaps are and where environmental coverage fits in and, and how it applies. Um, I think it's I think the challenge, especially on the brokerage side, is you go out and meet with your insured, right? And you say, hey, you've got this, you know, I don't know what's in that, in that drum, but I don't think it's covered under your current policy. Here's an environmental policy that could cover it. And your insured says, well, listen, we, I talked to my environmental health and safety manager, and it's non-hazardous, um, or it's all natural, or we've, you know, it's in a tank, but we've got our secondary containment around it, so we don't have, any exposures we have are, are, are mitigated. Um, I think there's a disconnect between what the environmental world, the scientists, scientists would look at these terms and what they mean and how they translate into insurance coverage. So I think if you talk to you know, someone like me or you know, Clifford here that have environmental backgrounds, we would look at this and say, oh, well, that's not a hazardous waste or that's not um, hazardous material, that's non-toxic. And to us, that means certain things. But that doesn't translate into insurance coverage, right? There's, it, with, when we read that definition, there was nothing in there that said um, it's only hazardous, right? Well, what about your typical waste stream? What about your trash? What about your garbage? Um, what about asbestos, right? In, in our world, asbestos is the first big environmental issue, right? We said that's where a lot of the evolution of our coverage has evolved from. Matter of fact, if it wasn't for asbestos and asbestos, and asbestos abatement contractors needing coverage, we may not even have an occurrence pollution policy right now. They were the drivers behind it. Well, asbestos isn't hazardous. Matter of fact, it's natural. It's an all natural material that you dig out of the ground. Um, it's also classified as a special waste, not a hazardous waste. So these specific terms mean specific things in the environmental arena, but they don't really translate over to insurance because the insurance issue is much broader. We would always, if you've heard us talk before, we get up here and talk about uh, transportation upset and overturn and, and what if it was milk and milk got into the, into the creek or you might have heard us talk about years ago about uh, Sunny Delight. You remember that one? When 
did I tell you? Okay, well, I won't talk about Sunny Delight. <laughs> we'll go on with that one. But you get these materials someplace where they shouldn't belong, and it's, it contaminates. Maybe it's the river, maybe it's a waste stream, maybe it's a fish kill, maybe it's whatever. So I think that when I go back to the uneducated buyer, I think it's because, like I said, there's the disconnect between what our environmental health and safety officer is telling the, um, maybe the risk manager with the insured and what the risk manager is hearing. And then the other thing they have to deal with is if they do, let's say, have a tank farm and they say, well, I think we have an issue here, we need, we need insurance. The environmental health and safety manager might be thinking, well, does that mean I'm not doing my job right? I told you, we've got second secondary containment, and we've got alarms, and we've got all these whistles going, and there's, no, there's nothing that could happen that we're not prepared for. So if you say that there is, that means I didn't do my job right. And that's not what we're saying. It's different when it comes to insurance risk. So if we explain this to, let's say, the uh, CFO and say, hey, there's potential for a spill or a leak or, re or a release that if the worst happens, it could cost us a million dollars or $5 million, $10 million, whatever it is, will that have a material impact on our business? And if the answer is yes, right, they should be thinking, okay, maybe we need to do all these things that our EH um, and S officers are doing, but how do we mitigate it further? How do we, how do we protect ourselves if, if the, the what if happens? Um, why don't we go ahead and flip to the next one. I'm going kind of quick, so I, certainly if anybody has questions too, let me know. They said we have about an, uh, an hour to talk, and um, I can probably get about two hours worth of talking in in that time, so. Um, all right, so what coverages are available right now? Well, as I mentioned, the history shows us that we basically had a limited coverage form, very narrow, specific to some certain markets, and that's evolved into really three different policies. You have a policy for contractors. Those are the guys who are gonna go to somebody else's site to do work, and that could cause a pollution condition. Um, so that's um, the, you know, the definition like I have up there, coverage for third-party BI, uh, property damage, and cleanup from pollution incidents caused by contracting at work at a job site. So let's think about my tank guy, right? Install the tank farm and the pipes. He, that was his work. What well, was the fence guy in his work that damaged the pipe? That's why the cover, the, that loss is going back to the fence guy. So your, your insurers that really, like I said, don't have that exposure, they're just putting up fences, that's the policy that he'd want to buy to protect himself in case something that he does with his operations causes a pollution condition. Uh, the contractor's policies can be written on a practice basis, right? An annual uh, policy for all their work at all their job sites. It can be written for a, a certain project. It can be written as a wrap up, either for the owner as an OSIP or the contractor as a CSIP. There's a lot of variations to how the coverages um, are worked. And with 40 semi carriers writing it, there's a lot of nuances. Um, I said some some forms are very very broad, where some are a little more limited. But the um, any more a form that you're going to want to be looking at is going to be occurrence based. Um, typically, you're going to get a very broad coverage. Or very, I'm sorry, very broad term for their work or their contracting operations. You don't need to schedule that anymore. The coverages are gonna include transportation and non-owned disposal sites. In, and um, that's again on a blanket basis. It used to be years ago, you had to schedule those non-owned sites, um, which made it really difficult for not only the insured, because they don't know where their waste from a particular job might be going, but certainly tough for you guys, because the brokers have to come back and say, where's the stuff going? Do we have it scheduled? Do we have it listed? And most of the time, you didn't. And when there was a loss at one of these facilities, everybody's mad because it wasn't scheduled. Well, now it's done on a blanket basis. You don't have to well, worry about that. Um, contractors' forms used to be you know, 30 pages long with 
you have 28 pages of exclusions, uh, now they're much more reduced. But if I were looking at a form today, I'd be thinking occurrence, I'd be thinking some amount of defense outside the limit, I'd want to make sure that the, the exclusions were fairly limited, no exclusions for insured versus insured or, or professional exclusions, certainly no exclusions for asbestos and lead um, because that, those are contaminants that you still find in building materials and contractors are still running across them. Um, but for the most part, you can find that. And uh, the coverage, like I said, has really evolved. Um, I think I'll leave that there and I'll turn it over to Maureen. Get a drink of water. As Mike said, there are different types of policies. He kind of went through the contractor's form, and some of your other options in the marketplace are the site policy. So your site policy is for your pure site risk. There's where you're operating, where you're owned. Um, any example could be, you know, a manufacturing location, um, you know, an oil uh, well location, anything that you actually are back to your site. So something you're operating, those policies get used a lot during transactions. Um, they're also there just to protect you from your own environmental risks. Um, Combined GL pollution policies are something that kind of came out of the pollution exclusion and probably the easiest purchase for your first time insurance, environmental insurance buyer because you're purchasing your pollution coverage with your general liability. So really what it kind of does is put your pollution exclusion back into your GL policy. Um, it's usually typically an annual policy, typically um, easily underwritten and for a person who has never bought uh, pollution coverage before, the microwave, sorry. Now, now you got me nervous because now I know I'm being videotaped. <laughs> Forgot about him. Um, but typically that's the best way to go about and buy your pollution coverage for manufacturing operation the first time around. A lot of people are scared um, of spending you know, money on a long-term policy. They're not really sure what they're getting out of it. Um, the GL, combined GL pollution policy is definitely um, something that's very readily available in the marketplace and something uh, Ironshore does sell. Excess policies uh, provide excess limits for any of the coverages. So um, let's say you needed, uh, for whatever reason, $100 million in limits. Um, you can buy excess coverage over just about anybody else's primary policies. Limits and terms vary by car carrier. You can uh, switch the slide. Just some ideas on the limit and term. Um, depending on insurance company or on the insurance company, policies can be written from anywhere from an annual year to 10 years in term. Uh, 15 years in term used to be something Mike and I talked about back in our AIG days when we were much younger. That doesn't really happen uh, very often anymore. Um, but typically, um, 10 years as long as you can go. That's typically on your site policies. A combined GL pollution or a contractor's policy is usually written on a shorter term basis. Um, Carriers vary on their limits. Ironshore does provide 50 million in limits, which is kind of on the high end of what uh, insurance companies provide on the pollution side. But um, anywhere from a million dollars to 50 million dollars can be purchased. Um, site policies are always claims made. As Mike said, the contractor's world has kind of changed in the last few years and occurrence-based coverage is pretty commonplace and something you should be considering if you're looking at a contractor's pollution policy. Um, one thing that has really changed in the last 10, 15 years in environmental insurance is the underwriting information that you need to get a policy and the premiums. I talk to people all the time that say to me, environmental insurance is expensive and very, very hard to buy. And it was probably, as Mike said earlier, 15 years ago when we were able to tell you what you could buy. Now there is lots of capacity in the marketplace, lots of carriers, um, minimum premiums on a contractor's policy go down to $2,500. Um, our, you know, the combined GL pollution policy is a $20,000 minimum premium. Underwriting information is not, a, you know, nothing um, complex. A lot of people feel like you need environmental reports, you need a lot of phase one, phase two. I don't know if those words are things you've heard of before, but really you can come to us and tell us what you want and we can tell you how we can structure the policy with the information you have readily available. Um, so if you've ever been thinking, I don't want to buy an environmental insurance policy because I don't have the information or it's going to cost me way too much, it's definitely something to revisit in the marketplace currently. And you can switch the slides. I think we're to Mike's contract group's pollution to uh, its claims examples. Well, yeah, we decided Actually, we can I tell my favorite claims example please. first before we... Um, before I steal it. Before you steal it. <laughs> you, can, you can do Sunny Delight, but... Um, you know, I talk to a lot of clients that say they don't need environmental insurance and that they don't have any exposure. And 
sometimes you know you need a fear, a little fear to actually convince somebody to buy one. But this guy was he told me a story about what happened in his operation. And what happened was he was a peanut butter manufacturer. So he had a rail car come in full of peanuts. And in the unloading process of the peanuts, there was an insecticide strip that was in the rail car, which somebody pulled out and threw it in their trash. The trash got picked up by a licensed hauler to take to, um, a, you know, to a landfill, a non-owned location for this insured. And in the landfill, it started to rain. And in, with when the rain happened, smoke happened, caused, nobody knew where the smoke was coming from, caused the whole neighborhood to be evacuated because of the concern of possible bodily injury. Well, that was traced back to the peanut butter manufacturer, that insecticide, because all waste is, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's all, you know, regulated and they know where it came from. So they were able to trace that back to the peanut butter manufacturer and find the peanut butter manufacturer for the cost of the evacuation. This guy did also say to me afterwards, he's like, will never happen again, so I'm not buying an insurance policy for it, but, you know. But, <laughs> so, but it did cost him a couple hundred thousand dollars that he could have had insured under an environmental policies. The, um, I think the key there is, you know, that, that, that what if scenario that people don't think about, right? That they say, well, this is, this is my known risk and this is how we're, we're attributing to it. That kind of stuff would never happen. Well, we had a, <coughs> years ago when a young little upstart worked at a, worked at a warehouse um, over on the east side, left that job to become an environmental consultant. So doing environmental consulting work, but decides he's going to go back and talk to his old buddies at the warehouse. So they're talking, what do you do now? And I said, well, I do asbestos inspections. So, you know, what is that? Well, I walk through buildings, and I look at ceiling tiles, and I look at floor tiles, and I look at pipe chases for asbestos, and then I write reports, and, and I'm like, well, you know, what do you mean? What do you see, like asbestos, like the fiber? I'm like, no, you could see it. Like a, you know, that particular ceiling tile right there probably contains it because it's this size or this dimension, or that floor tile is nine by nine, which means it has asbestos in it, or in the mastic, in the glue. And uh, so we're talking, and um, one of the guys, I, one of the guys, the character what I'm talking about used to work with said um, to his manager well there's asbestos in this building and my lungs hurt so I'm calling OSHA so OSHA shows up to the warehouse and they said we heard that there's asbestos in this building and we're going to check it out so the manager calls his boss and says hey OSHA's here so the head environmental health and safety officer comes down so the, so the manager and OSHA and the EHS guy walk around the building they go into the alley and this is over in uh uh, State Park, Collinsville, Caseyville kind of area. So they're walking through the alley, and there's trash. Someone threw bags of trash back there. And uh, man, this, the um, EHS guy was mad, mad that he had got called down there, mad that OSHA was there. So he says, you know what? I'm calling the police. They'll come here and find out whose trash this is. So a police guy shows up. The cop comes out, and he's like, you want me to dig through the trash? He's like, yep. You go find an envelope. You find out whose trash this is. So, so now the police officer's mad because he's rooting through trash trying to find out whose trash this is. So he goes through, finds an envelope. Oh, you know, here it is. Got the guy right up. Like, Whoa, wait a minute. There's quarts of mortar oil down here and in this trash, and it's leaking all over the place. So the cop goes, well, that's not me. That's EPA. Luckily, they're right around the corner. So they call the EPA. So now we have OSHA, and we have the EHS guy, and we have the police, and we have the EPA walking through this alley. And the EPA comes out and says, okay, so X, you know, this is what's, what's spilled here. This is what we have to do, clean it up or whatever. And it was just a, a little bit, so it didn't cost the company much to clean it up. But long story short, I'm not able to go back to that warehouse anymore. <laughs> um, no, the, the, the key is if I said there could be a scenario where you'd have OSHA and the police and the EPA out there. Everybody's like, you know what, they're crazy. No, this, this crazy stuff does happen. Now, in this case, it didn't cost them much to clean it up. It wasn't a big deal. But who knows, right? It could have. And going back to Maureen's example, it's this silly stuff that we see. Um, you know, I threw a couple of pictures up here and um, to go through some of our claims examples. Actual examples, examples, actual claims that I've had over the years. Um, I think my favorite, we'll start with this one. So 
You know, you've seen these, right, um, above ground storage tanks, either at one of your insurance facilities or maybe a contractor brings it to a job site and sets it up for all his equipment if it's a big excavation grading or, uh, project or whatnot. We had a contractor working at a facility put his car in reverse and back up and knock the tank off of, its, off of its perch there, off of the legs, and the tank actually rolled down and rolled down a hill and cracked like an egg into a creek down below. So it ended up, well, that one was um, $350,000 to get it cleaned up because <clears throat> they had to go down and clean up the stream and clean up the, the, all the um, diesel fuel that had leaked out. I actually, was just working on one yesterday where um, my contractor had the tank at his facility and um, they had secondary containment around it, which would be this tank, but sitting in basically a bathtub, right? So if it leaks, the bathtub holds it, which is perfect because that's what it's supposed to do, right? Unless it fills up with rainwater and the insured, one of the employees decides, well, pull that little plunger out, get that rainwater out of there, and that way it, it's not holding in that way. If it leaks, it's all, well, they did it, and the water drained out, but they never put the plug back in. So the tank started leaking, and it just ran the whole 500 gallons out, down his property, and onto the neighbor's property. So that one's probably going to be close to uh, 750 to get that cleaned up. Um, our street and road guys, pavers, I, I guess all projects where they're going to spray a sealant over the asphalt must only happen 45 minutes before a rainstorm. Because we've had a half a dozen losses where they spray, they put the asphalt down, they spray the sealant down, and the rains come. Right, and it washes it all off, goes into a creek, goes down the, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's funny how many losses we've had that way. Some of them are small, $35,000. Some of them, uh, several hundred thousand dollars to come back and clean up. And, and most of it's testing and sampling and figuring out what's impacted and how we, how we address it. Um, and then the, the lower left there, you see these guys pulling back the vinyl wallpaper and finding mold. Well, <clears throat> My street and road guy had a mold loss. And as an underwriter, I'm going, well, there's one class of business that I want to write all day because they don't have mold losses, and it's street and road guys. Well, it works out fine unless you pave the parking lot the wrong way. So when it rained, all the water rushed back into the building and uh, ended up having to clean up the basement and, uh, you know, we tear out drywall and carpet and had the mold growing and it was, a, it was a mess. So I guess none of the classes that we have are safe from mold. <laughs> and mold happens to be, on, on, at least on the contractor's pollution side, that's, our, that's where I see most of the claims. If it's um, window installation, roofing contractors, siding contractors, plumbers, HVAC guys, any one of those, I could give you a claim scenario for it because we've, we've had them, we've, we've had those claims, we've paid losses on those guys. Anywhere that water can get into a building um, can have mold loss. Matter of fact, we had one where um, they put the tank, the small, you know, whatever, two, 300 gallon tank for a, for a backup generator in the penthouse of the building. So they had their generator going and their tank going while the tank leaked. So not only did you have issues because there's fuel running down inside the building, right? They had mold growing now because of it too. <clears throat> so you can't, uh, can't get away from mold. Um, I talked about this earlier, asbestos and lead still being prevalent, and it is. If you have buildings built really before 1970, 72, you still have the potential for lead-based paint, you have the potential for asbestos. And a contractor going into a building may not know, right? May not know what's behind that wall, may not know what the, what the materials are, are made of. Or they might actually know, right? They, they'll come in and say, look, we've sampled our building. There's no asbestos here. You're safe to do your demo. Well, what they don't know is the building was built about that time and, and the contractor who built it had building materials left at the warehouse. So they said, you know what, in this one room, we'll just lay this old tile that I have to get rid of it. Well, that 
in particular room then had asbestos in it. And we had a contractor who did that. The building was clean, right? They had information on it. Well, they started tearing up this old tile and found out it did contain asbestos and the mastic below it, just in this one room. So they had to come in, shut down the project like this, put the containment up like you, if you remember, like an ET, right? They had to vacuum off everything uh, to clean up their mess. Um, I've, been, I've had a contractor who did asbestos abatement. They had their containment set up. And if you've seen like kind of heavy, large industrial buildings with big uh, amounts of asbestos either on pipes or on the ceiling or whatever, you have to bring in big equipment. So this guy had um, some equipment in there, some man lifts and whatever. They actually had you know, big scrapers to scrape off the, the floor tiles. Well, that big scraper, that's just vinyl you know, plastic. So rip went the, his, um, his, uh, his tool that he was using went right through it. Now you've got a gap. Now they have, second, they have this ventilation set up, which puts a negative, uh, negative pressure on that, in that building. So if there is a cut in the vinyl, whoosh, it sucks it all up. But in this case, the rip was so severe, they had to shut down the factory and take a bunch of samples. Now, at the end of the day, it wasn't very much to, there wasn't really anything to clean up. There didn't get any fibers, but they had to shut down that plant for the day. So there was a lot of other impacts because of what our abatement guys did. Um, and then the last couple I'll talk about, we've got our track hole there pulling up a tank. I think this one is just a picture of them removing a tank. <coughs> but any of our contractors, any of your insureds who put anything into the ground, if it's a shovel, if it's a backhoe, or whatever it is, just tell them to stop hitting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> anybody who digs in the ground they hit tanks they hit pipes and all of them every single every single one is exactly the same it says right here right here there's nothing in the ground we have information that says there's no pipes here there's no tanks here well it was wrong or you read it wrong or you didn't have the dimensions right or whatever it might be because they all hit something and um and we've had, just recently, we've had tanks hit, we've had pipelines hit, um, we've hit, uh, it, this goes back a few years, but ask any environmental consultant how many clean sites he's cleaned up and he'll go on all day. Um, the, there's a lot of thought that, hey, this site is clean or we haven't found contamination here. That just means you haven't found it, right? You haven't hit the right spot. It could be, um, it could be a situation where like we had a loss in St. Louis years ago where they sampled the first six or eight inches of the soil, and then they went down, they sampled, let's say, 15 feet down, and they said, we didn't find anything, it's clean. Well, what they didn't know was the site had some topography at one point, so they backfilled a little bit to level it out, so from the depth of five to eight feet was contaminated soil. So when my contractor came out and started digging up this clean soil, he found this little area that wasn't clean, didn't know it, moved it, and sat it over on the back 40 over here as he continued his work. Well, um, under environmental regulation, you have 90 days if you have contaminated soil or uh, if you've driven by the bridges that they're working on now and they've got the big tarps on them and they're taking all that paint off, that's lead-based paint. And then you see those five or six little drums sitting on the side of the road for a couple of weeks until they're gone. Well, that's the, that's the spent paint that they've taken off, and they have 90 days to get rid of it. Well, this guy set that soil on the back because he's going to backfill it later and use it over 90 days, so he created an illegal dump site. So then the regulators came in and said, we've got a couple of issues here. We've got not only the contamination that's here, right? We have now the contamination over here that we have to deal with and you know here's the regulation where you did this 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 wrong but now all the soil underneath it has been sitting there so long that's contaminated too so and 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 that is a real mess because who's at fault right is it the contractor is it the owner well under circle it doesn't matter everybody's going to pay so the government gets to sit back and say okay we got this issue it's going to cost five million dollars to clean up it doesn't matter to us you guys figure it out who's going to pay that's where the insurance policies come in, right? Does our owner have a, a site-specific policy? Does our contractor have a policy? Um, and one thing I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with is just something to think about. I did a presentation um, for a group, um, AGC, down in Southern Illinois years ago. 
talking about kind of the same thing. But back, back then, it was mold, because mold was the new thing. And I was like, you know, your attorneys are saying mold is gold, right? They're going to look for mold losses, and we're talking about it. And um, then they went around the room and said, who has, who has uh, uh, pollution insurance? One guy raised his hand. They all looked at him and said, wow, you've got contracts with pollution insurance? He said, I sure do. And he looks at his broker and says, I've had it for years under your E&O. You've never told me about this. So after loss isn't where we want to figure out, do we have coverage? Do you have the right coverage? Have we talked about the coverage? What have, what have we done? It's a great way to introduce insurance policies that can fill that gap. And like Maureen said, right now, it's easier than ever to get, and it's, it's a lot more affordable. Um, with that, I'll let uh, Maureen step in and talk about a few more claim scenarios. Sure. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask either one of them right now while Maureen's coming up? Anybody? Sure. Yeah, you talk about policy coverage and periods of, of talk about policy coverage and the fact that you can claw the authorities can claw back many many years to to who used to own the property that type of thing if you are um, either renting or own a property and then have that policy in place during that period of time and then you leave that property and then years later somebody comes after you to because there was some pollution found on that site how does that work so what you're saying is if you were at one one main street in 1975 and you moved out of one main street and went someplace else to be covered under a pollution policy because they're claims made policies you would need to keep that location on what we would call a pollution schedule as either a divested property or depending on how policy wording works depending on the carrier it could just be continued on that policy because of otherwise there would be no scheduled location and claims made, the claim needs to be made in the policy period. That, um, you know, lots of things factor into that contractual wording. Like, I mean, you can set up contracts when you leave and go, like maybe you're no longer liable for it based on the contract. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, because of the claims. And CERCLA can't, and CERCLA can't uh, override that contractual obligation or um, depending on you know like if you had a non-owned disposal site which is typically probably where you would see these things circle could get involved in it it kind of depends on if insurance would provide coverage for it or not depending on how your policy was set up I mean you could end up being liable for something that you unfortunately would, might not have insurance coverage for uh, yeah you, you mentioned um, environmental studies that are done on a site prior to purchasing property or evaluating whether you're going to purchase it or not. Does, does a phase one or a phase two environmental do anything to mitigate uh, what future, um, future claims can be made? Is there any protection at all that you get from having that study? It seems like Mike has a response. Uh, <laughs> Mike seems to have it. Kind of. I'm sorry if I'm stepping on toes okay. here. Mike um, was the environmental consultant in the group. Yeah, well, I used to write uh, phase ones. But um, really what happens when you have a phase one, there's a couple of reasons why you want to do it. Most of the time, it's only done because the lender says you have to do it, right? But the other way to do it is now under environmental regulation, that's really the only way you can, you can um, protect yourself from down the road from environmental um, regulation coming back at you. Um, and this is relatively new over the past few years, but typically a phase one is done because somebody's buying or selling a site and the bank says, well, we are, we're going to lend this money to you only if you do this report. Because as the lender, they want to see that the site is controlled or clean so they can lend money on it. Because what they don't want to have happen is get, they don't want to get a dirty site back. And lenders really struggle with that. Matter of fact, <clears throat> when I wrote phase ones, banks by far were our largest clients. They would, that was part of their due diligence to say, um, you know, what's the site like? What's the chances of it coming back? So, um, so yes, it can help you with CERCLA and some environmental regulation down the road if you have this. Because what you're able to do is say, um, hey, here's my proof that this site was controlled or clean, you know, when I owned it. Um, it's kind of like the on only backstop. 
And um, depending then on what the contaminant it was and when it was there, and maybe they can say, hey, look, you clearly didn't cause this. You didn't own the site or operate the site when the contamination was found. You're good. We're moving on to the next guy, right? So that's kind of where the phase ones fit in. Now, if you do a phase one, they might say do a phase, what, a phase one is an environmental assessment. That's just a review of the property, right? A phase two is where they come in and they actually take samples. So they might say in the phase one, we saw a tank on the property and there's a little bit of staining right here. So what we want you to do is take some samples to see what that could, what, if that's contaminated or not and see if, what we have to do. So the, the actual physical process of coming out and taking those samples is your phase two. The next step is phase three, where they say, oh, we found contamination here, we have to clean it up. So phase three is the cleanup. Uh, that's what those kind of how those steps work. And uh, most common when you're talking about environmental documentation, it's the phase one. So hopefully that answered and probably too much information. But. <laughs> Anyone else? Questions? Well, we'll go through a couple more claims examples. Like can't remember, we can go to the next slide, I'm not sure what picture I've got. Um, actually, this, is, this picture here can illustrate Mike's weekend. Um, we had a, a claim this past weekend with one of Mike's contractors um, managed to cut one, um, a pipeline in doing some cleanup that actually I insure. So we managed to get two of our claims, or two of our insureds and one big claim over the weekend. But um, that's something we see a lot of is the, we write a lot of, um, pipeline exposure and contractors either cutting the pipe. Or one of the biggest claims I've ever seen was actually on a brand new pipe that was up in an oil field in North Dakota uh, and unfortunately in a pretty remote area and over the course of the winter, leaked all winter, um, salt water is extremely damaging to the environment, um, caused a $25 million uh, a cleanup which unfortunately um, for the contractor is actually going to be subrogated against them because they installed the pipe incorrectly. So we were paid for the original cleanup of the claim, but the contractor will be involved in the fact that they, when they installed the pipe underneath the reservoir, they crimped it and caused the actual leak. Um, the sunny D light that um, Lawson and Mike was talking about, everybody will say, you know, pollution is only about hazardous materials. Well, sunny D is not hazardous. I'm not going to tell you it's good for your children, but it's not a hazardous um, chemical. Um, we insured sunny D at one point in time in our life, or somebody that made it, I don't remember, was actually sunny delight. Um, and unfortunately, there was a release into a river, so gallons and gallons of that orange drink flowed down the river, looked beautiful. Um, unfortunately, Sunny Delight is definitely not good for fish. And it killed all the fish in um, the river. Um, you would think fish aren't worth a whole lot, but when you put a price tag on an individual fish and you add up all the fish you killed, you can get into multi-million dollar losses. So, um, you know, we've seen lots of transported cargo losses, so people hauling things of, you know, non-hazardous paint, milk. Milk's also something that's not very good for fish. Um, every time somebody dumps a trailer, there is always a creek. Nobody would ever, ever get in a car accident and dump, <laughs> dump anything out unless there was a creek. Um, we had a claim, six, seven hundred thousand dollar claim um, with an iron shore that a truck driver was eating, eating a banana. And I don't know what he, threw the peel, wasn't paying attention, managed to hit something, and he dumped all of his oil in the back of his truck into a basement in rural Indiana. And now we own a beautiful home on some rural road in um, Indiana. But, it's, you know, it's, it's human judge, you know, human error can cause a claim that you could never believe can happen. Does anybody have any specific, uh, you know, of their operations that they'd like a claims example for or anything that, um, questions? You know, Mike and I could probably go on all day long with uh, things about claims, but if, um, you know, we're, he we're here afterwards to talk, if you have any other questions. I don't think we had anything other slide-wise to. Okay, I, mean, I feel like we're kind of regurgitating the same types of claims, but basically what we really want you to know is that in your standard GL auto and property policies, there's very limited coverage for pollution. Um, lots of people say I have pollution coverage. Um, a standard GL policy, for ex example, has a give back that gives um, hostile fire coverage. So a lot of people will say, oh, I have hostile fire coverage in my general liability policy, but really all that's giving you is soot, fumes, and vapors. So if you had a fire at your facility, and the fire department came flying out to down millions of gallons of water, 
on your fire, which is their job. I mean, they don't care what they're doing to the environment. Their job is to put out that fire. Well, all that runoff um, is contaminated with what's ever in your facility and can become a very, very large pollution loss that would not be covered under your standard GL policy, even because you have the hostile fire give back. Can you get sued if your neighbor pollutes you? I mean, you can get sued. Anybody can sue anybody. Uh, you know what? I would say that you could get involved in a lawsuit, and if we, you had a pollution policy, we would defend you until we could get it back to them. Where you could run into issues is if you did not have a pollution policy, so you did, your GL carrier might not be willing to defend you based on the allegations in the lawsuit. So, and it's really worse, too, if the contamination goes through your property to the next guy, because now you're responsible for what moved on yeah, you know, it's just something to consider. Um, as I said earlier, lots of people think it's extremely expensive. Um, it's something they're never going to pay a claim for, but it's at least, you know, willing to, um, something you should be willing to at least get an indication price-wise and coverage-wise. Lots of different markets in, uh, in the world these days that provide many different types of coverage. Mike and I would love to write your insurance, but there are other, there are other options out there. Anyone else? Maureen, oh, one more question. Here we go. What if you're a manufacturer and you're leasing a building? Who's responsible if there's fault in the building itself? The, the owner of, that owns the lease or the manufacturer? It would depend probably on the contract that you set up between um, yourself and the landlord of the building. Um, I mean, the owner would probably be responsible. But you could also be responsible if, you know, depending on what you caused. If it was your actual operations that caused the loss, um, what we find in most of those type of situations, it's the contract that is set up between you and the uh, building owner. Did you have a question too? Um, I would say that the limits moving is a couple of things. I mean, the claims dollars are going up, um, and I think it's the availability of it in the marketplace is that people are able to get the coverage, so it's not so daunting a task as it was five years ago, ten years ago. Um, you know, people say to us all the time, I can't believe you guys pay claims, and I'll tell you, you know, I sit in claims meetings on a quarterly basis, and it's amazing the mold claims we do pay. Um, and mold is very expensive to remove, and um, depending on where where it happens, it can be you know sensitive receptors, kids or older people that can get sick from it. People are kind of sensitive to the mold issue right now. Anyone else? Nope. Well, we'll be around if anybody wants to ask us questions afterwards. That would be great. And thank you for your time. Appreciate Maureen, it. Maureen, Mike, thank you very much for presenting today. Appreciate it.